Good morning and happy spring. I'm Laura Zakowski, Vice Chair for Education, and I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Sweet this morning. Dr. Sweet completed her BS, her MD, and her residency here at UW. Awesome, triple badger. She then became the Trowbridge Endowed Primary Care Chief Resident this year. <clears throat> Recent awards and honors that she's received include the Lawrence Crapper Award given to a resident who has demonstrated outstanding practice of general internal medicine, as well as she's been inducted into AOA Honor Society while in medical school. Dr. Sweet is an author on a recent publication in Arthritis and Rheumatism entitled Associations of Post-Discharge Follow-Up with Acute Care and Mortality in Lupus, a Medicare Cohort Study. Wow, that's great. This was the editor's peak of the journal in February, and I'm sure we'll be hearing a little bit more about that today. Dr. Sweet has also presented several research posters and clinical vignettes, and a few of those topics caught my eye. One on Kikuchi disease, which I had to look up and see what that was, and another concerning a woman who had chickens and a hot tub. Hmm. <laughs> We are very excited, Dr. Sweet, to have you join us as a rheumatology fellow in July, and we're looking forward to learning more from you today. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Zakowski, for that warm welcome. Um, yeah, go to the Medscape article if you're curious about the chickens in the hot tub. Um, so I'm, I'm just so excited to be here this morning in front of you all, and thank you so much for those of you here in person and virtually. It's not lost on me what an honor it is to uh, be up in front of you here today. And so I'm excited to talk with you about disparities among people with lupus and how we can improve health equity in this complex and heterogeneous disease. I have no relevant disclosures. I thought it was fitting that I'm giving the first Department of Medicine Grand Rounds as May, as May is Lupus Awareness Month. So learning objectives, by the end of this talk, I hope that you'll be able to explain how social determinants of health directly impact people with lupus and how that causes disparities with people um, who have lupus in the United States. Next, I hope you'll be able to integrate the importance of transitional care management of chronic diseases with health outcomes to people who have lupus and who are most prohibited from this ambulatory care. And lastly, coming away with ideas on how to implement some clinical and research-based strategies to reduce the health inequities in chronic diseases. First, I'll begin by giving you a uh, little bit of historical background and terminology, and then we'll delve into the epidemiology and health disparities. Next, I'll talk about hospital readmissions and how that can be a marker of quality ambulatory care. I'll talk about some of the specific projects I've been involved with in, as Dr. Zakowski alluded to earlier. And then I'll end with the uh, future work to improve health and equity. So lupus is Latin for wolf, and this term was first applied to any ulcerative facial lesion during the medieval period of time. It was labeled this way as it was thought these lesions contained ability to gnaw at or sort of devour the flesh, similar to how a wolf would. I think this terminology is quite harsh and just kind of one um, basically uh, uh, example of how there was um, sort of like uh, a historical context studying and managing diseases and, and how scientists and clinicians viewed patients as subjects to be studied rather than actually seeing the humanity behind these patients as a person. And then up to as recently as the 1900s, physicians still labeled skin rashes that had ulcerative lesions as lupus when in fact they may have represented other skin conditions such as TB, cancer, pellagra. I wanna talk about a little bit of terminology here. So when I say lupus, that can encompass a couple of different terms. The classic one we think of is systemic lupus erythematosus or SLE. There's other forms including cutaneous forms of lupus. The classic one we might think of is discoid lupus, which causes those disc shaped rashes. You can also have drug-induced lupus or neonatal lupus. So 
for the purposes of this talk, whenever I say the term lupus or SLE, I'm referring to the systemic form of lupus. This was taken from Hebra's 1856 Atlas of Skin Disorders and thought to be some of the first depictions we've seen of ulcerative skin lupus-like lesions on the face. This atlas only depicted these lesions on white people. So again, still speaking to the history of um, the racism and lack of representation of skin phototypes other than white people that still exist today in current dermatologic education and research. Here are some different examples of acute cutaneous lupus on lighter skin phototypes. It appears more red and darker. It's more violaceous appearing. And then here's the discoid rash I was talking about earlier. And acute cutaneous lupus doesn't just have to manifest as that classic male or butterfly rash. It can be on other parts of the body as well. Here's an example of a hand rash where it spares the joints involved, almost like the photonegative version of Gautron's papules. So I think most clinicians in this room can agree that lupus is, can be an incredibly difficult diagnosis to make. And we've come a long way over the years in establishing that diagnosis. It goes to show that lupus always seems to make its way on the differential diagnosis when we're in a you know morning report where there's sort of vague or cryptic symptoms that the patient presents with. So starting off in 1971, this is the first time that the American College of Rheumatology classified a diagnostic criteria. You had to fulfill four out of 11 criteria. Some of these criteria involved manifestations that we still classically think about, like low white blood cell counts or kidney disease. It also included a false, if you had a chronically false positive syphilis test, we know about 20% of patients with lupus have a false positive test due to the cross-reactivity of the antiphospholipid antibodies. And this was actually at the time, the only immunologic marker um, incorporated into the criteria. It also uh, included the presence of a lupus erythematosus cell. So for any pathology enthusiasts out there, this cell I had never heard of before. Um, I didn't learn it in medical school until I was um, looking up stuff for this talk. But basically, it's a macrophage that has phagocytose denatured DNA material and causes this purplish red dot hematoxylin in the cytoplasm. In 1880, 1982, there was additional criteria, and that's when ANA uh, double-stranded DNA and some other immunologic markers had been included. In the 1997 revised criteria, I know a lot of people in training might have learned from a, like the SOAP brain MD mnemonic that I learned from. So this is the criteria that um, it was classified as. And this is when they removed the lupus erythematosus cell. It was thought to be less sensitive than an ANA and then also less specific and included antiphospholipid antibodies. We then went on to 2012 slit criteria that was more specific, but led to significant diagnostic delays in certain populations. And brings us now to the 2019 ACR criteria, which removed the false positive, importantly to know the first time it removed the uh, chronically false positive syphilis testing, required a positive ANA and then had a, uh, an involved weight scoring system, including seven clinical and three immunologic domains, added fever, delirium, low complement levels. As you can see, it has a pretty good sensitivity and specificity now, but it's still not perfect. I'll talk now about the epidemiology and health disparities. So it's estimated that about one and a half million people have some form of lupus in the United States, about one in 1,100 people or a little less than 0.1%. So somewhat of a rare disease. It is, as I alluded to before, a multi-system autoimmune disease that systematically affects people who have suffered from social, political, financial, and healthcare marginalization in our country. It's two to three times more common in non-white women with a prevalence up to one in 369 um, American Indian or um, Native Alaskan women or one in 500 Black women who identify as Black. It's important to know it mostly does affect um, women, but it's important to know that it does still affect men. 
And most women are diagnosed during their reproductive years. So it does tend to affect people at a younger age. And about 15% of individuals diagnosed with lupus are children. The burden of lupus can be very high on patients and the healthcare system, particularly when we look at kidney disease. It's a multi-system disease that affects the kidneys and about 50% of uh, people with lupus will go on to develop kidney disease. About a quarter of those will go on to develop end-stage kidney disease, necessitating, um, requiring either dialysis or a kidney transplant. It's also a particular burden given that kidney disease seems to develop in people who are um, more prevalent under the age of 50. In studies, it's also shown that people with lupus have up to two times the amount of acute, acute care use, including hospital admissions and emergency department visits compared to those who don't have lupus. And in other studies, we see people with lupus have up to 15% premature mortality. One staggering statistic that I saw was that lupus is the number five overall cause of death among Black and Hispanic females aged 15 to 24 years old. And given a prevalence of little less than 0.1% in our population, I thought that was pretty astounding. Along with differences in health outcomes by age, we also see significant differences in health outcomes by socioeconomic status. So socioeconomic status is a complex construct we think of that usually involves domains of educational attainment, some form of measure of wealth. And what we see is repeatedly that SES has been associated with worse lupus activity and physical functioning. In another study, lupus caused four times mortality among patients who lived below the poverty level. And then in a large cohort study, it was found that um, disease activity, disease damage, and poverty appeared to be the most important determinants of mortality in this disease. So again, switching gears a little bit, thinking about the disparities we see in age, in um, in socioeconomic status, we also see significant disparities in race and ethnicity. So in one study, in multiple studies, end-stage kidney disease incidence among patients who identified as Black, Asian, Hispanic, or Native American was significantly higher than those who identified as white and up to seven times higher in Black cohort. Thinking about mortality as well. This study looked at patients who died after their diagnosis of lupus, and lupus mortality was about two to three times higher in the patients who identified as Black, with about 17% of patients in this cohort dying before the first white patient died at four years post-diagnosis. These disparities by race and ethnicity seem to be pretty unique to the United States. In an international study that looked at 11 other developed countries, including Canada, Mexico, countries in Latin, uh, in South America, in um, Europe and Asia, they found that the patients who identified as African American had over two times the relative rate of disease progression compared to these other countries, indicating that African heritage was not associated with faster damage in these other countries. So I wanna take a little step back. These health disparities are driven by a number of socioeconomic and healthcare factors. Along the top row, we can see various social determinants of health, which are the conditions that people are born in, live in, and live their life in that can have significant effects on outcomes. And so while a lot of the research that we focus on looks at various healthcare um, markers, really what we're focusing on is economic stability, food, education. We know from prior research that social determinants of health play such a large role in health outcomes of patients um, and that Healthcare, increase in healthcare quality and increase in healthcare access only you know, mildly improves some of these disparities that we see 
This brings me to another important point where I want to discuss how I'm thinking about race and ethnicity in this research. So when I talk about race and ethnicity, I'm using it as a proxy measure for the lived experiences that people are affected by institutional and systemic racism. So while we're talking about some of these healthcare outcomes, really I'm looking at how people are affected by these adverse social determinants of health. We know that race, and, that race is a social construct, not a biologic one. So we're not making biologic inferences with this research. Specifically looking at how systemic racism affects people with lupus. So we know that systemic racism exists. Some examples would be redlining, which was a housing policy and procedure implemented in the 20th century that um, basically situated non-white people in environments that were low, that had low beneficial resources, high exposures to toxins, pollutants, and also prevented generational wealth accumulation. The preferential hiring of white people over non-white people, limited funding to schools that primarily serve students of color, and mass incarceration, just to name a few. These elements of ingrained institutional racism then have further downstream effects on basically indirect effects of um, unequal access to healthcare, deviations from standard of care, increased rates of stress levels, which then causes other downstream effects such as decreased retention in, in ambulatory care and quality of care and a higher pro-inflammatory state that we know has also epigenetic implications. And this overall leads to some of the disparities that I've been talking about and will talk about. So we talked about how social determinants of health directly impact people with lupus in the United States and cause disparities. I wanna switch gears and talk about hospital readmissions and how this can be a marker for quality ambulatory care. So Gangovi and Grande came up with a framework classically thinking about readmission rates as a marker of either the classic model is that that's an indicator of the health status of the patient and also the quality in patient care that somebody receives. But we know there's much more to hospital readmissions than just the health status of the patient and inpatient care. The health services, including outpatient quality and access to care, the access to care in the inpatient setting, and then the socioeconomic resources that I talked about earlier, along with the interplay of health policy, drive hospital readmissions. Thinking about access to care, we know that there's differences in rheumatology care access by neighborhoods in the United States. From Dr. Bartle's work earlier in 2020, they identified that patients living in the most socioeconomically disadvantaged neighborhoods had a 60% lower odds of having consist consistent ambulatory follow-up in lupus care along um, and that patients with lower SES associated with significant delays to rheumatologic care. This map highlights the per capita distribution of adult rheumatologists in the United States. So in addition to patients who are in disadvantaged neighborhoods and have lower socioeconomic status, we see that patients who live in more rural locations as well have decreased access with most distribution of access being in the darker areas and sort of in that northeastern region. Thinking about quality of care, there's really not a lot of research out there, specifically in lupus, looking at quality markers and how this affects disparities. There are a few studies out there, and um, in this study, they looked at 13 different identified lupus care quality measures from um, quality measures such as counseling on wearing skin, on, uh, counseling on sun protection, to vaccinations, to osteoporosis screening for patients on glucocorticoids. And what they found was that there was lower quality uh, lupus care reported by patients who are non-white, younger, lived below the federal poverty level and who lacked health insurance. This figure was adjusted for age, poverty, disease duration, and healthcare insurance. So we can still see in the adjusted model that patients who are non-white uh, experience lower performance overall on some of these lupus quality care measures. 
And we know that high quality lupus care, including disease monitoring, is associated with lower damage from prior studies. Thinking about hospital readmission rates, specifically in lupus, one out of four people hospitalized with lupus, um, one out of four people with lupus are hospitalized each year. So again, thinking about disease prevalence, um, systemic lupus is ranked as the sixth highest chronic disease of hospital readmissions, according to a 2010 US hospital report with 27% of these patients readmitted within 30 days. And again, just thinking about that prevalence of less than 0.1% in the US. In 2021, Bartle's group found that about one quarter of lupus related hospitalizations were readmitted within 30 days, which was almost identical to the rates of heart failure readmission. So we know of heart failure being a chronic disease that has very high rates of readmission. Interestingly, when in this model they adjusted for um, proxies of, uh, of social determinants of health, such as age, sex, race, ethnicity, neighborhood disadvantage and rurality, they actually found that there were lower readmission rates among lupus compared to heart failure, suggesting that perhaps social determinants of health play a very large role in readmissions rather than the natural disease, what the natural disease pathophysiology course might have taken itself. In this study, they also observed readmission rates among um, different groups. So overall, about a quarter were readmitted, but when we break it down by specific groups, we saw that the younger age groups, 18 to 33, were more likely to be readmitted in 30 days, those with end-stage kidney disease, and then Black patients who had been relegated to the most disadvantaged neighborhood at a, a little less than 40% 30-day readmission rates. In contrast to where heart failure readmissions, usually the readmission diagnosis is a heart failure exacerbation. What they found in this study was that lupus related rehospitalizations had a variety of primary readmission codes, things such as um, uh, cardiovascular disease, infections, and then opioid related hospitalizations really driving home the point that follow-up care, both specialty care in rheumatology, but also in primary care is especially important. This brings me to talk about transitional care management and how we can prevent people from being readmitted. So most people know that um, in CMS, Centers for Medicaid and Medicare Services, introduced this transitional care management model to try to reduce hospital readmission rates within that 30-day post-discharge period. What that encompasses is a two-day follow-up phone call with somebody and then a visit within, 17, within seven to 14 days. It's shown in heart failure to, re to reduce readmission rates and also to a lesser extent in COPD, but has the potential to improve care and reduce costs. So I wanna talk about one of the papers that I was involved with here at UW with the rheumatology nephrology folks and also the folks at the Center for Health Disparity and Research. What we were looking at in this study was we wanted to assess how disparities existed in the post-discharge follow-up period by race, ethnicity, neighborhood disadvantage and the rurality of where a patient lived. So what we did was we evaluated the association of timely follow-up within that 30-day period and whether timely follow-up in 30 days had an effect on acute care use, which we defined as emergency department visits, inpatient observation stays, or hospital readmissions, and whether that timely post-discharge follow-up had an effect on all-cause mortality. We hypothesized that patients with lupus who are part of populations experiencing health disparities would be less likely to receive follow-up, and that timely follow-up would be associated with lower rates of hospital readmission and mortality. We used a Medicare cohort study, which was a 20% random sample of hospitalizations, national hospitalizations. The reason we chose this cohort 
was to qualify for Medicare. We classically think of people being on Medicare over age 65. To qualify to be on Medicare under age 65, you either have to have end-stage kidney disease or you need to have social security disability insurance for two years. We know that around a third of patients with lupus are on Medicare and more than half of Medicare, um, more than half of lupus related hospitalizations are covered by Medicare in the age under 65 group. So we use this 20% national data sample and we took any hospitalization that had an ICD code for lupus we used the time period from January to November of 2014. The reason we went to November was so we could follow up the 30 days post-discharge into December. And then we also used the, day, the data from the year prior for comorbidity assessment. The outcomes we were looking at was people who had timely post-discharge follow-up with either primary care or rheumatology within 14 or 30 day period. And then we looked at the 30-day acute care use and then the 30-day all-cause mortality. We adjusted for patient factors and looked at different patient factors such as race, ethnicity, neighborhood disadvantage level, rural, suburban, and urban residents. What we found was in this study over 8,500, there were over 8,500 lupus related hospitalizations and a little in over 5,000 beneficiaries. So this graphic demonstrates the follow-up care that patients received. As you can see, most follow-up care happened with primary care providers, which is highlighted in the blue bars. And then about 18.3% of follow-up happened with rheumatology care. There was more follow-up, or excuse me, there is more, um, there were more hospitalizations in the under 65 age group than the over 65 age group. And what we found was after about 14 days post-discharge, about 47% of patients had follow-up. And by that 30-day post-discharge period, about 65% of patients had follow-up. So still a 35% gap where patients did not receive any timely follow-up in this cohort. This, this figure is looking at adjusted odds ratios. So patients who are under 65 were uh, more likely to receive follow-up if they were older, if they um, lived in a sm small town. So older, more likely follow-up to have in rural neighborhood disadvantage. And then if they had end-stage kidney disease, they were less likely to follow up. And then in the age 65 and older cohort, we can see neighborhood, neighborhood disadvantages per decile. So in the age 65 and older cohort, drug and opioid use disorders were um, associated with more um, follow up. If we look at acute care use, we see that 37% had acute care use or death overall. So the dotted green line looks at mortality, and then we see observed ob observation stays, readmissions, ED visits, and acute care use. In that acute care use group, um, we found that there were disparities among age group as well. So those who are aged 18 to 35 had 55% higher rates of acute care use compared to those in the older cohorts. And again, we see observed rates um, broken down by decile of neighborhood disadvantage. So we can see a trend of greater acute care use among patients from the more disadvantaged areas with a 13% spread. At the top, we can see the greater disadvantaged groups to the bottom with the less advantaged groups. And then looking by race and ethnicity, we see that patients who identified as Asian, Black, Hispanic, Native American, um, all had higher rates of acute care use, particularly high in the Native American group. Looking at adjusted hazards ratios for acute care use itself, in the age under 65 cohort, we found that actually follow-up wasn't associated with, with decreased rates or increased rates of acute care use. 
We did see other factors that were associated with um, acute care use though, such as other comorbidities like alcohol use disorder, anxiety, depression, and congestive heart failure. However, looking at the age 65 and older cohort, those who did receive timely 30-day post-discharge follow-up did have a significant, actually conversely and paradoxically to what we thought, had a 27% increased use of acute care. So either using more emergency departments, hospitalizations, or inpatient stays. Breaking down the results by mortality, so on, overall, we found that patients who um, had that close 30-day follow-up had lower mortality when they did follow up with a hazards ratio of 0 0.53. In the age when we stratified by age under 65 and over 65 in the age under 65 group, we found that there was no um, there was no difference in, in follow-up care with decreasing mortality. However, in this age 65 and older group, when patients had timely post-discharge follow-up care, there was a 65% reduction in mortality with this follow-up. So conclusions of this study, we found that 35% of patients with lupus lacked 30-day follow-up People living in the most highly disadvantaged neighborhoods, rural areas with end-stage kidney disease had lower follow-up overall. And then interestingly, in that age 65 and older group, follow-up was associated with increased acute care use, which wasn't what we thought was going to happen in our hypothesis. However, there was significantly lower mortality in this group with a 65% reduction in mortality. We think that this might be due to the heterogene heterogeneous um, and complexity of the disease lupus and that patients who follow up with a primary care provider, with a rheumatologist, they might have other factors going on. And so that might lead to um, increased acute care use. We also found that the youngest age group and that people who identified as Native American had the highest rate of acute care use. There were some limitations to this study. So this was all observational data. So no way to make a causation effect with this data. And then this data did not include nephrology visit follow-up. And there is question of the generalizability of the Medicare cohort that was under age 65. But again, we know that patients with uh, lupus uh, Medicare covers about 50% of hospitalizations patients under age 65, and um, that uh, around a third of patients with lupus are on Medicare. So at this point, we've integrated some of the importance of transitional care management of chronic disease health outcomes to people with lupus who are most prohibited from quality ambulatory care. I next wanna focus on the future work to improve health equity. I was lucky this year to join Dr. Garg's group that looked at lupus nephritis in a meta-analysis where the results have not come out yet, but we looked at a meta-analysis to basically try to determine whether individual level uh, social determinants of health versus community level social determinants of health were more sensitive and in predicting adverse health outcomes. So what we did is we did a mesh search criteria and found 512 studies through these databases that looked specifically at lupus nephritis and health outcomes. And we found 14 studies for the meta-analysis. And the objectives are to calculate the pooled estimate of odds ratios for outcomes. So the outcomes we're interested in looking at our mortality, cardiovascular, cardiovascular events, and end-stage kidney disease in lupus nephritis. And what we hypothesize is that patients who have adverse social determinants of health will likely have poor outcomes. However, looking at the individual level social determinants of health, so this includes factors such as race, ethnicity, um, people living below the federal poverty level, those on public health insurance, compared to community level social determinants of health. So people who are um, living in more disadvantaged neighborhoods or certain zip codes, we think that those individual level 
ones might be more sensitive than the community levels. And then also examining data sources and tools, how to collect and measure the social determinants of health within the electronic health record itself. So this brings me to our electronic health record. There's a social determinants of health wheel where we can monitor different factors in patients. So this is a snapshot from UConnect showing a test patient. You can either find it under the snapshot section or it's under the history section. And this covers 11 different domains of social determinants of health. And basically it prompts you to ask one to three questions to the patient and it identifies the patient with red if they're higher risk, yellow if they have a rising or medium risk. And what we can do with this, if we do identify any adverse social determinants of health, there's smart links where if you type in .sdoh, it can bring in a dot phrase into your note. And then the idea is that it would prompt a social work consult to get that patient connected with some of the resources and help improve disparities. Strategies to improve health equity. So tailoring interventions to populations with higher risk for readmission. We know that those with younger age group, which can be a proxy for measures such as barriers to access or substance use related hospitalizations. Folks who live in more disadvantaged neighborhoods or zip codes, their education level income, public health insurance, which is all a proxy for socioeconomic status. Patients who identify as non-white race and ethnicity, which is, could be a proxy for the lived experience of racism. Those with end-stage kidney disease and those with lack of social support. I know there's already some, um, some uh, basically measures out there in primary care and in rheumatology care to sort of see like a benchmark um, marker to see which patients might be in those more um, higher risk groups and then reaching out to those individuals. Also using more of the electronic health record to record social determinants of health and then interventions at both clinical practice level and research-based strategies. So some of the clinical interventions we can think of would be having a health equity champion this is either anybody in the clinical setting, so a social worker, physician's assistant, medical assistant who shares health equity information with the clinical team and addresses social issues. Also thinking about community health workers, this might be also known as other people as a navigator, but typically they're members of the community who share something similar to the patients like a medical diagnosis and help bridge care to patients by addressing certain um, social determinants of health and directly reaching out to those patients, helping them navigate the system and sharing their own personal experiences. And then thinking about the patient-centered medical home. So this idea that we bring all the resources to a patient in the medical home itself, including dietitians, nurse case managers, psychologists, social workers, so really trying to bring all those resources. I know in the rheumatology department and other departments as well, we do have UW social workers there. And then also increasing practitioner engagement and health equity training. Some of the research interventions we can think about is including disenfranchised groups in the research process itself with community or patient engaged research or community based participatory research. So when we include patients and community members from idea conception to dissemination of research, we know this really increases buy in from patients and also helps um, dissemination of research, making it more re relevant, translatable, sustainable and improving the possibility and improving, hopefully reducing health disparities. We can also define race, ethnicity, and gender in appropriate ways using mixed methods that capture the social context of patients. So including more qualitative research and then certain statistical methods like multi-level modeling. And then using system-centered language. So how we classically think about 
patient-centered language by talking about a patient as a person rather than a diagnosis. This system-centered language is really a li linguistic call to action that seeks to end dehumanization of people that occurs when discussing how they experience oppression. As an example, the word vul vulnerable, it can mean a positive thing when you're talking about an emotion, but if we apply the term vulnerable repeatedly to the same group of people, we might begin to think that there's some sort of inherent, inherent weakness or um, some kind of um, inherent deficiency or failing. So instead, thinking about terms like disenfranchised, similarly, a word like at risk could have the same sort of connotation if used repeatedly. So instead of using at risk, using the word exposed to additional harm. And this just helps incorporate more of a socially appropriate context that um, looks at the systemic and institutional racism that patients experience. And then another um, aspect specific to lupus research would be to include more patients who identify as um, American Indian or Alaskan Native and Latinx people. Dr. Garg, I know, is um, modeling a hydroxychloroquine medication tool and translating that into Spanish. And I know there's multiple other um, projects ongoing to help decrease disparities that I didn't even mention here. So at this point, we hopefully you have some ideas of how to implement clinical and research-based strategies to reduce health inequities among people with chronic disease. I think for some future directions, so Dr. schletzbaum Bowler, who's, the, who's an MD-PhD student that I was lucky to work with this year, as I referred to earlier in some of those quality care measures of lupus, there's really a paucity of research. And so Dr. schletzbaum Bowler wants to look into um, more disparities on lupus care quality indicators. So monitoring serologic testing and some of those other quality measures like vaccinations, um, and then the connection of quality indicators to outcomes. Also looking at cohorts from multiple payers and then pilot studies to increase serologic testing. And I think it would be really cool to start looking at how integration of social determinants of health into the electronic health record could increase resource connections and possibly reduce disparities in an equitable way. Also thinking about being able to look at population health and navigator strategies. So looking at some of those um, groups that have been disenfranchised and looking at it from an at-a-glance dashboard view and having one of those navigators reach out specifically to those patients rather than sending a MyChart message or a letter, but having those people who have experienced things similar to the patients reaching out directly to try and improve retention and care. So some takeaways, lupus health disparities persist by race and ethnicity, younger age, socioeconomic status, and patients who live in more rural areas. Improving healthcare quality through tailored interventions may lead to better outcomes and health disparities. And research dissemination and intervention should properly capture the socio-political context and the root cause driving these health inequities. We know that the way we report health inequities models the way that we're gonna find solutions to these health inequities. So making sure that we're appropriately stating how these health inequities persist. And also just taking away that improving healthcare access and improving healthcare quality among people is not gonna be enough moving forward. We really need to dismantle the systemic racism that exists in our society to reverse some of those adverse social determinants of health that people experience. So May 10th is World Lupus Day. I wanna acknowledge uh, there's been so many different people in my life that have made such an impact. So Dr. Bartles, I'm so grateful to you for driving my interest in rheumatology, getting me involved with research. You've shaped my, my education and career so much. Um, Maria schletzbaum Bowler, who's an MD PhD student that also was a really wonderful mentor to me and taught me a lot about 
um, research and statistical analysis, other, other people involved in Dr. Bartle's group and um, all the folks involved for the Center for Health Disparity Research. From the Department of Medicine, Dr. Kelly Lavin, who I worked with as a third year medical student for the first time. And she really drove some of my interest going into internal medicine and has just been an amazing human being to work with. Dr. Shivani Garg, who I've been lucky to work with this year and um, learn more about meta-analysis and learn more about healthcare disparities and how we can combat health healthcare disparities. Dr. Christine Sharkey, who's been my mentor this year and also somewhat of a life coach to me this year as well. Dr. Andy Coyle, I've learned so much from him um, and he's just been such a wonderful leader to work alongside with. Johanna Striley, Dr. Lynn Schnapp, Dr. Betsy Trowbridge, the whole APD leadership team, and then the, the residents too, especially the primary care track residents. It's been such a joy working with all of, with all of you. And um, I've just learned an immeasurable amount from, from working with you. So thank you so much. And then a personal thank you to all my family members, especially to my husband, Matt, who's been my main supporter throughout medical school and residency and our beautiful son, Wade. And then a huge shout out to my co-chiefs, Gabby, John, and Sarah. We've been through thick and thin this year together. I'm really gonna miss, especially on Fridays, teaching with all of you and not being able to see you every single Friday. That's been like one of the highlight of, of my week. So thank you so much for just being overall amazing people. Thank you to everyone. Thank you so much for listening. Dr. Sweet, such a wonderful presentation that here is yet another area we really have to work hard to be anti-racist, don't we, in, with our patients. So thank you for that information. I was thinking about what has helped us with making sure we have patients come back to clinic when they're in the hospital with a diagnosis of heart failure. You know, that's been worked on a lot, but the same thing has to happen here with lupus patients. So I'm wondering if the connection between the EHR in terms of diagnosis of lupus and there's some progress or some area that can be explored to make sure there's an alert or something that comes back to us as primary care saying, make sure to see this patient within 30 days. I don't know if there's any work in that area. Uh, that's a really great, great question. I'm not aware of any work in that area right now. I know I could be wrong on this, but I don't think CMS necessarily um, reimburse for those follow-up visits with lupus, but or they do, they do reimburse for the CMS. Um, but in terms of like flagging that patient, I think that's a really great idea, especially because we know that readmission rates among heart failure are so high. And so um, thinking especially about follow-up in lupus with primary care providers is also really important too. So I'm not aware of any research going on, but I think that's a really good idea. Hi, Dr. Sharkey. <laughs> Dr. Hi, Dr. Sweet. Um, I actually thought that the slide with the social determinants, I think we should go back to that. And I saw people taking pictures of that. So maybe a lot of people don't even know that that's something that we have in our um, EHR. And, oh, in the EHR. Yeah, and I, I definitely think that's a pro tip maybe for a Department of Medicine meeting that we could bring up. So uh, kudos for that. That slide, I, didn't, I actually didn't know about it. Um, my question is also on the follow-ups. Um, do you find, and you know, maybe colleague, my colleagues can speak to that as well, that also um, having a decreased amount of providers or physicians, uh, especially rheumatology, we don't have as, as uh, maybe robust, that those follow-ups, it's a little bit harder to achieve in our, in our clinics given the um, you know, the amount of physicians or, right. or other providers that get in there. And then um, any thoughts a little bit about thinking, uh, just thinking outside the box here, but um, where we have extended providers, um, maybe we could make more champions of, for them being um, health determinant social um, in our clinics. And I was just thinking about that out loud as well. Yeah, so. definitely. So I think Dr. Sharkey brings up a really good point that having 
30-day post-discharge follow-up can be incredibly difficult in specialty care, especially because we know specialists, it's booking out months. And so um, I know, and again, having that close follow-up with, with primary care, but I know there were studies done in China where they actually looked at training um, nurses to reach out with a phone call and who had been trained in specialty care services related to lupus. And so definitely I think trying to get a navigator or community health worker involved, but then also um, if there's a way that we could get some sort of clinician involved as well that doesn't necessarily have to be a physician, but could be um, somebody who's trained to deal trained in the disease process and manifestations and knows the health disparities of lupus, if there's a way we could kind of coordinate more of a um, interdisciplinary post-discharge management. I think that at least in those studies where the patients had those follow-ups with nurses who are specifically trained in lupus, it did show decrease, it showed better quality ambulatory care and increased retention and in care. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I just want to uh, agree that I did not know this existed, and I'm very interested in uh, seeing how how much this is used. Do you have any idea how often this is this is filled out? The social determinants yeah. of health wheel. Yeah. I actually I don't know how often this is filled out. Dr. Bartles might know more about how often it's filled out. So. Um, but yeah, I'm not sure how often it is. And just, just so um, people li listening virtually can hear Dr. Bartle's response. So Dr. Garg is actually using this very consistently in lupus nephritis clinic, um, but maybe about 5% of the time, this social determinants of health wheel is actually being utilized and it's nationally, um, but it's existed for about two years now. Thanks. So your next to last slide, the last point talked about the root causes and things. So I, I wondered whether you have looked at any of those individual components of the social determinants. You know, there's economic ones, there's environment ones. Have you looked at any of those to see which of the specific components, because lumping all those together, you lose a lot of that uh, granularity. Sure, so you mean using specific social determinants of health components on some of these outcomes or some of these yeah. future yeah. directions? Instead of just you know, one metric, there are different sure. components to it. Yeah, so I mean, in in prior studies, I guess adjust, trying to as best we can adjust for different social determinants of health to maybe get a better idea, but I'm not aware of specific studies. I think Dr. Bartles. University of California, San Francisco has done one looking at housing, similar to the um, national study where they looked at that moving to opportunity study where they saw better health outcomes kind of globally when they move people out of areas at risk, I'm using bad language or at risk, but um, areas experiencing I, I disparities. Um, um, and they did see an association of lower damage in people who actually moved to better neighborhoods, which is interesting, but it may be also sort of those may be intertangled on causation um, because if you're doing better clinically, you can work and live in a better place. Right, so, right. Um, There's still so much to be learned, but that's the that's one of the studies I'm, I'm aware of. And I think, again, many studies to be done. Um, absolutely. And, and, and I think when you look at that, um, what do you think about the disease onset and how that might impact things like education and economic opportunity? What would you say about that, Nadia? For disease on onset and economic education and up. Sure. Yeah. So as you can imagine, anybody who's suffering from 
lupus and the disease manifestations of lupus, especially because we know it causes end stage kidney or it causes kidney disease in 50% of people. That's definitely, if you're using healthcare systems, if you're going to the emergency department, if you're having to follow up, it causes disability. And so that in and of itself would just limit your ability to have, you know, higher educational attainment to et cetera. So yeah, I definitely, I think that's a really good point that you brought up, Dr. Bartles. Fantastic green round, green rounds. Um, do we know um, why follow-up reduces risk of death? I mean, is it cardiovascular? Is it lupus? Is it infection? What, what are the causes that seem to be uh, occurring less frequently, I guess, in those people who've had follow-up? Yeah, so in terms of follow-up care, the patients who received follow-up, um, the 65 and older group actually had reduced mortality. So we know at least in that age 65 and older group, I don't know if I'm answering your question, Dr. McCann. Hypothesize that follow-up was good because it reduced mortality, but what was it about the follow-up that led to re reduced mortality? Do we know, oh, for instance, I oh, geez, say. you know, these yeah, people yeah. so, heart failure or yeah. infections or bad lupus? Right, and I think, I think they're, um, because we found, we thought they were going to have um, decreased acute care use, we actually found increased acute care use, but I think that close follow-up and disease monitoring and okay, maybe this infection, we know that people with lupus get hospitalized for many different reasons, like you, like you already mentioned, infection, cardiovascular events. And so I think having that really close follow-up, although it did lead to increased acute care use, um, I, 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 yeah, I would hypothesize that patients who had that closer follow-up, say they did have residual infection, or maybe they were still having cardiovascular symptoms, that follow-up then might have led to the, the acute care, which then... Yeah, I, I guess I was just wondering if there was data to say, yep, yeah, these are the causes that were reduced, because that might actually influence what kind of follow-up. I mean, maybe it is not going to be important for a rheumatologist to see somebody, you know, in 30 days. Right. And... Care. Right, right. I see what you're saying. And I, I, in terms of like specific type of follow-up, I definitely think there's room for that in future studies, definitely at like what type of follow-up. Is it rheumatologic, uh, you know, nephrology, primary care? So that's an excellent point. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. We have a few comments online. First from Dr. Cheda, amazing presentation. This was the best presentation I have seen highlighting and contrasting social determinants of health and racism and, and race. Thank you very much. Dr. Cheda. And there was a really a thought provoking idea. What about home-based healthcare as a way for follow-up? I know you, there's probably been no research on that area whatsoever, but that uh, an idea thrown out there. So yeah, I'm not aware of any research, but I definitely think looking at home based follow up care um, with health outcomes, and if that reduces disparities would definitely be an area for further study and to look into. Yeah. Well, that's what we have for questions. Any other questions from the audience? All right. Thank you again, Dr. Sweet. Awesome presentation. Thank you so much.